Okay, uh, good afternoon uh, everyone, uh, my fellow Rotarians from the Rotary Club of Makati and Rotary Club of Premier District. Uh, I'm happy to be your um, moderator this afternoon. Also, of course, to our uh, friends and guests from uh, invited by our fellow Rotarians. So let me now call this, this uh, let me now uh, call on uh, our uh, presidents of both clubs to call this meeting to order, starting with uh, EBP Pet Peter Mansano. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Director Chris. On behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati, I now call this 30th regular club meeting and joint meeting to order. EBP Ricky Pinedad, please. Good afternoon, everybody. In behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati Premier District, I call this meeting to order. Thank you. Okay, for the invocation, may I now call on uh, Ravi Daryan Nani from RCM Premier District. Thank you. Let us bow our heads and feel the presence of our Lord. Lovingly Father, the past few months have been dark and fearful, wherein many have lost their lives and work. Fortunately, with your guiding hands, a few organizations brought light to the darkness. To name a few was our club, Rotary Club of Makati Premier District, Rotary Club of Makati, and BDO, who went out of their way to assist and donate PPE to many. We were all your humble servants, extending help to save lives. Dear Lord, thank you for having brought us together, which includes this afternoon. We place our hearts and minds in your hands so you may continue to guide us. Let our aims in this meeting be aligned with your direction. May our actions be valuable to our aim, which is to build up and edify one another. Oh God, we believe in you, we hope in you, we love you, we know that you're very near. Watch over us, protect us, and keep us from harm. Keep us together so we may continue to serve. We love you, oh Lord. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. Now we'll have the national, the singing of the national anthem, followed by the RC Makati hymn. Please put your hands on your left chest. We live to lead. We believe in 
Now let's recite the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. Number one, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Is it Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Again, good afternoon, uh, my fellow Rotarians, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this joint meeting of uh, RCM and uh, RC, RC Makati Premier District. For the birthday greetings and wedding anniversary celebrators, we have the following birthday celebrators. Uh, PP Eddie Yap, today, October 13. Happy birthday, PP Eddie. PP Roger Davis. October 17, Roger Colliantes, October 19, and the following Rotary Ants, Baby Freak, October 17, and Army Jimenez on October 18. Okay. Now let's have the introduction of uh, visiting Rotarians. Maybe PP Raisa, you can. Uh, uh, Welcome the guests of your of your fellow Rotarians from RC um, Premier District. Okay, I have here the list. We have number one, Miss. Uh, or Miss Erin Nicole Fernandez, Mukesh Advani, Jackie Buncan, Baby Cheng, Ludette Cruz, Pippi Shirley Ferrer, Kate Harrison from RC Singapore. Uh, we have CP Carol Mercado, oh, one of my partners, Boyet Murcia. Joy Gladys Ejercito, Corina K, Shanghai, Terry Chiu, Chu. We have also Reggie Ponferrada, Charilu Puno, Ivy Santos, Leslie Soberino, Son Sunny, Tony Orutia, Maria Irma Tan, Mirna Villa Carlos, Maridel Villa Vicencio, Bobet Berra. Jose Marie Yupanko and Hazel Swilig. We also have from uh, the group of our Perfect Vision Presidents, Mr. Roderick Ginto, R.C. Las Piñas, Larry Samaniego, R.C. Las Piñas, Camino Real, Ed Garma, R.C. Makati Central, Conrad Banal, R.C. Makati Das Mariñas, Richard Cariño, R.C. Makati Gems, Catherine Ronquillo, R.C. Makati Olympia, Earl Manyo, R.C. Makati Paseo de Magallanes, Fernan Mabanta, R.C. Makati Poblacion, Kati Lopez, Montinlupa North, Danny Delphine, R.C. Paranaque, St. Andrew, Mingo Domingo Jr., R.C. Taguig West, and Anne's, we have, of course, First Anne, Anne Manzano, we also have Lulim Hoko, Cecil Dairit, Nelly Bengson, 
Renalyn David and Jeanette Sulweta. Welcome to our joint meeting with RC Makati Premier District. Now let's proceed to the President's time, starting off with the PBB Peter Manzano. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, fellow Rotarians, our lovely aunts, and uh, guests. Allow me to say hello to my classmates, the Perfect Vision Presidents. Here's my report of the things that we have been doing the past week and what we shall be doing the next week ahead. Last Saturday, my wife Pam and I, together with representatives from the PPCRB, Comelec, our partner clubs, the Rotary Club of Makati Olympia, led by PBP President Kat Ronquillo, and the Rotary Club of Paranaque Central, led by PVP John Obong, and our Rotaractors were at the San Ildefonso Paris Church in Barangay Pio del Pilar, Makati, for the launching of the Voters Registration Assistance Campaign. What we expected to be just a handful of people turned out to be a big group of 127 applicants from Barangays Bangkal and Pio del Pilar, mostly new registrants, transfer voters, and those who failed to vote in the last election and want the registration reactivated. Our Rotor Actors, who shall be frontlining the project through uh, election day in May, 20, May 2022, were very helpful as they helped in handing out registration forms, assisting registrants in filling them out, and in making sure those who came at the parish observed physical distance and other health protocols. And as an added service, we provided two vehicles to transport the registrants to the Comlec office and back to the parish center. The parish-based voters registration assistance will continue to be provided every Saturday until all of those eligible to vote in the barangays near the parish are registered. The goal is to replicate the, this activity in all of the parishes, not just in Metro Manila, but all throughout the country. Of course, with the help of the Rotary Clubs in the locality, in coordination with PPCRB. Also, last Saturday, we went to Paranaque to join our partner clubs, the Rotary Club of Paranaque Metro, headed by PBP Weng Reyes, the Rotary Club of Paranaque Metro South, headed by PBP Rose Bilarde, the Rotary Club of Paranaque Midtown, headed by PBP Nicole Belinas, the Rotary Club of Paranaque St. Andrews, headed by PBP Danny Delphin. It is for the distribution of the 55 brand new big uh, bicycles to the beneficiaries to be used by them in going to work under a paid forward scheme. Of course, all the beneficiaries underwent road safety training before the bikes were handed to them. As the quarantine rules is up, we have lined up some more outreach projects in the following weeks to come, and we shall be, we shall be announcing as soon as they firm up. Finally, please join us later after our regular meeting via Zoom or Facebook for the second district town hall on education entitled High School Teaching and Learning Challenges Today and Beyond. We have sent you the link in our Viber group. Thank you, that's all from me. Okay, thank you, uh, our very busy uh, President uh, Peter. Now, uh, may I call on uh, PVP Ricky Trinidad for, the pre for his uh, message. Greetings, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, our co-host, my classmate, Peter Manzano. I just have two short announcements. Um, the first is uh, I'm delighted to announce that on behalf of District 3630, 30. uh, uh, I'm sorry, 3830, our District Governor Chacha Camacho has nominated our very own Dr. Hazel Zwelling to Rotary International for the 2021 Rotary People of Action Champion of Health. We're hoping that uh, our own Dr. Hazel wins the award and the awarding ceremony will be at the World Health Organization headquarters in Geneva on February 27, 2021. Thank you, that's all. All right, thank you, uh, PP. Uh, President Ricky Trinidad. Now let's go straight to the introduction of our guest speaker by uh, past president Raisa Echanova Posadas of RCM Premier District. 
Yeah, hi. Good afternoon and welcome. It's great to be back here at another joint meeting between my club and its mother club, the Ruti Club of Makati, which is also the club of my 92-year-old dad. I know so many of you, so it's good to see everyone. Today, it is my privilege and honor to introduce our guest speaker, Nestor V. Tan, or Toti, as friends and family call him. He and I have shared a corporate affiliation in the BDO family for the past few years, but I actually met him about 20 years ago. I was a banker and BDO was my client. And in one of our meetings, I remember asking Toti how BDO managed to acquire banks with different cultures, different IT platforms, and different markets, and yet assimilate them so seamlessly into the organization. It was like they had their own in-house management consultancy group that efficiently worked at streamlining processes and realigning technologies post-acquisitions. As they grew, they remained nonetheless very, very nimble. Since then, under Totti's leadership, BDO has gone through 10 mergers and acquisitions, paramount of which was the purchase of Equitable PCI Bank. It was like a David and Goliath deal at that time, with the BDO acquiring EPCI Bank, which had more assets and three times more capital than it had. It was the business case that you would have wanted to study during your MBA. Over the 22 years that Nestor has been president and CEO, BDO has grown leaps and bounds. From being the 20th largest bank, today it remains the largest in the country with three trillion in assets, almost 1,500 branches, close to 4,500 ATMs, and 37,000 members of the BDO team. It closed 2019 with a net income of 44.2 billion. Shareholder returns have consistently outperformed the market. BDO has won almost every international award out there and several years in a row. So if this were the Oscars or some other award body, BDO would have already been elevated to the Hall of Fame to give other banks a chance. Therefore, it is not a surprise that Nestor Tan was named Management Man of the Year in 2019 by the Management Association of the Philippines and was adjudged best CEO by several international finance publications based on a poll of global investors and analysts. He is chairman of BankNet and was former president of the Bankers Association of the Philippines. Totti graduated cum laude from De La Salle University with a commerce degree major in accounting and finished his MBA at Wharton School. He's a CPA having landed sixth in the CPA exams. I know many of you here from Rotary Club of Makati are from that school in Loyola, but we from Rotary Club of Makati Premier District are predominantly from that school in Taft. And so we take great pride in knowing that Toti here is the chairman of De La Salle University's Board of Trustees. He also avidly supports the UAAP men's basketball team and women's volleyball team and often watches the games. So today, we are so excited to hear what he has to say about BDO in this new normal, in a changing banking environment. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, the very accomplished and yet so humble and a family friend, Nestor V. Tan. Thank you, Raisa. <clears throat> that was so kind. Um, Mr. Peter Mansano, President of the Club of Makati. Mr. Ricky Trinidad. President of Rotary Club of Makati Premier District, Rotarians, fellow quarantiners, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be here today. And when Reiza asked me to speak to your group, the first thing I asked is what would it be of interest to you? And she was so convincing that she said, we'll worry about it later, just mark it on your calendar. So I couldn't say no. And two weeks ago, I said, just talk about BDO in the new normal. So if you don't mind, I'm going to talk a little bit about the company that we are so proud of. We have made mistakes. We've had some successes. But clearly, we are a work in progress. So if you don't mind, I'd like to share some screens to better illustrate what we've done during this pandemic. I don't know if it's showing up. 
I'm not a good. Uh, is the screen showing up? Uh, no, I we don't not see. Yet. It. Uh, hold on, hold on. There, is it? Yeah, wait, hold on. Yeah, there, there it is. It's showing now, sir. Thank you. So BDO in a changing Philippine environment. I think the best way to describe it are the steps that we've taken during this pandemic. Um, can you hold on? I'm not good at this thing. I'm, I'm going to ask some help. Yes, they can see it. They can see it. I'll go ahead. Here. Okay. Um, how do I move it forward? Okay. Okay. One of my uh, skills is in IT. So can you see the screen now? Yes, thank you. Okay. I guess in today's current environment, the COVID-19 pandemic is a game changer. And if I were to look back from March to where we are now, I see three steps in our adjustment to this pandemic. One is adjusting to the new rules, the quarantine, the lockdown. Second is normalizing. And the third is actually sustaining. This is living up to the new normal. So let me start with adjusting. It's simply finding ways for us to keep moving. Let me share with you a little bit of perspective that uh, most people probably do not appreciate with banks. We are considered an essential industry. Healthcare workers can't get sick or else nobody will take care of us. Pharmacies can't run out of items or there's nothing to, there's nothing to buy that will cure us. In times of uh, calamities, hardware stores cannot close. Otherwise, they won't be able to support the recovery. And I guess the same thing with banks. We have to make sure cash is available and we are open. And clearly what we needed to do was to adjust to this new environment. When we heard that we were supposed to close and just have a skeletal crew, but operate to support our clients, the first thing that we did is to address the people issues. We established a skeletal crew that will run the company at least for the next two weeks and think Given the situation, we even had to provide shuttle services for them and food packs. Some we put up in hotels close by. If they live far enough and we can't get them to a shuttle, we put them in a hotel close by just to be operational. We even put forth what we call COVID care, which is a teleconsulting service um, for medical issues they can actually issue prescription and you can order through digital means or through the phone medicines. Okay. Then we issued some health kits to our client, to our employees. This includes vitamin C, alcohol, face masks and face shields. And we established team A, team B, to make sure that if one team is infected, another team then can come in and take over. Okay. Another problem that we had, and I think most of you will relate to this, is that all of the authorities that banks receive from clients are in the form of signature cards or corporate resolutions. And clearly, when we are going to make transactions, we need to have alternatives to wet signatures because clients are not there to provide us with the documents. So we have to make client accommodations in this situation. 
And of course, we need to make sure that there's liquidity across the board. ATMs must be filled up, branches must have cash, so the armored trucks keep on running. One of the things that we did was actually to take what we call preemptive provisioning. And this is to protect the bank's balance sheet. This is our conservative estimate of potential losses due to the COVID pandemic. And clearly it's substantial. What we wanted to do was to put it behind us and make sure that we're able to proceed without thinking or worrying about how the losses will impact us going forward. A few things I'd like to point out. Despite the provisioning, we have not impaired our capital. Our services remain intact. And we are able to service the clients without um, any problem. And our uh, dividends were maintained. So those are some of the things that we've done. After the adjustment, we started to operate and the next thing we looked forward to was normalizing. What do we mean by normalizing? It's simply scaling up. Because we've been able to operate with a skeletal crew, the question is, can we scale up a little? Can our um, shuttle services scale up? Can our branches scale up? So that is the next thing that we tried to do. What we've noticed too, is that the companies are also opening up. They're starting to transact. So basically we have seen our transaction levels reaching pre-COVID levels. And therefore scaling up is not a discretionary thing. We have to do it. And these are some examples of our branch. Look at the number of people. Initially, we were supposed to close the branch at three and given the number of people, most of our branches are closing at 4.30 and 5 because we have to service them. And because of social distancing, sometimes we have to keep them outside. So we really need to scale up. For those of you who may have been affected wherein your branch was closed, you sometimes have to worry, what if I need to access my safety deposit boxes? So those are some of the things that we need to make sure we're able to address. So in scaling up, we made sure we beefed up our um, safety precautions. We put in acrylic shields in branches and offices, temperature checks were appropriate, social distancing in elevators, okay, cues were necessary. And believe it or not, some of our offices even have one-way corridors to protect people from uh, being too close to each other. And we, we had an expert in uh, occupational safety to help us in addressing these things. So when we did scale up, we also did regular COVID testing. We use antigen and we have testing facilities all around the country. Right now, we have a capacity of about 45,000 to 50,000 a month in testing uh, facilities. We made sure that people come to work in a safe environment, okay? One of the things that we've done actually is we've engaged the client. Clearly this is an unusual time and an unusual uh, period for all of us. So we wanted to make sure that we're able to address their needs. For most of us, I admit, the problem is more tiding us over during this period. And I would say it's about 12 to 15 months. So we needed to make sure that we're able to help the client tie them over with their liquidity requirements and cash requirements. Where necessary, we, rest, we restructure the loans and where appropriate, we try to help them with um, the cash necessary to continue operating. Another thing that we did is in addition to team A, team B, we have established what we call redundant locations. Team A, Team B will allow us or will give us protection if a certain member of the team is infected. But recent LGU requirements um, um, makes us 
unable or recent LGU requirements do not allow us to use the facility for a period of time. So what we've done in addition to Team 18B is we've established Location 1 and Location 2 redundant locations, which means that if one is down or inoperable, the other one can pick up from the other. Of course, this is not all good news for us. We've had our problems, and I have to admit these are growing pains. Most recently, we've had capacity problems with our online banking, and it was not accessible easily uh, during a period of time. We also had call center problems. And clearly when you're running a skeletal force, you don't have full capacity of um, your call center agents. And unfortunately, this is not something that we can easily outsource because of the Back Secrecy Act. We need to have employees manning the call centers. So those are just some of the growing problems that we've had in trying to reach uh, normalization, getting it to be a U. Hopefully these things are behind us and um, my apologies if you've been inconvenienced, but we're trying our best to cope with the volumes given our existing infrastructure. After normalizing, this was about three months ago, we realized that the pandemic is not going to be uh, leaving anytime soon. So we went into sustaining mode. So we considered the pandemic situation as the new normal for all of us. So we went on moving with our own business as if it was pre-COVID, it was a pre-COVID environment. Okay. So we are now at the stage where we're anticipating the needs of the economy and the economic recovery. At this stage, I'd like to step back a little bit and give a background on how we see the banking industry. You've all heard about Bayanihan 2 and the requirements initially of Bayanihan 2 to give a one year loan repayments freeze for all borrowers. And my apologies for most of you who probably know this, but I just wanted to run through a little bit of how we see the whole thing. Banks have a fiduciary responsibility to take care of your money in the granting of loans needed to support the economy. And our funds come from, first of all, equity, which for most of you, you only see as the C family or SM group. Those are the strategic shareholders. But you are actually shareholders of the bank directly or indirectly through mutual funds, through your retirement funds, through your life insurance uh, policies, and sometimes directly through your brokerage account. And you are also a stakeholder of the bank because you place deposits with us. Those deposits and the capital are the ones we lend to borrowers. And you could be also a borrower of the bank. Loans, if we do our job right, will get paid back and the liquidity will allow us to service your withdrawals. Bayanihan 2 will impact payments. And if there's no payment coming back, it begs the question, will we be able to service withdrawals? Now, clearly, maybe we will be able to service some, but if the fear is there that we may not be able to service all deposits, the industry runs the risk of a bank run. Nobody wants to be at the end of the line waiting for cash if they need it. So by any hand too, I'm glad that the BSP stepped in and was able to um, come to a compromise of giving a 60 day holiday. A 365 day holiday would have been problematic. I'm giving this background to share with you the dynamics of banking, bank earnings, and lending. Banks use deposits for loans. They use deposits for liquidity. And they use capital to support loans. This is what we call the capital adequacy ratio. A certain amount of capital translates to a certain loan capacity. When you increase capital, you increase loan capacity. 
But when capital declines, loan capacity declines. Therefore, banks need earnings to increase loan capacity. If their earnings, loans capacity increase, we can support the economy. If their losses, on the other hand, loans capacity declines. Okay. Um, this is something that I'd like to share with you because there's the view that banks are making enormous profits. In absolute terms, we are because we deploy a huge amount of capital. But in terms of uh, relative return on equity, if you look at this, this is for the last five years, among the top earning companies in each industry. These are just the top earning companies in each industry. You will look at that the banks earn roughly just half of what power and utility companies earn. And only retail is lower than banks. All the rest make more money than banks. Okay. Also, there's this mistaken view that we run a monopoly, much like a franchise. There are 94 commercial banks and savings banks. So it is what you call a competition or a competitive environment. 19, 2019 is actually not better off, but worse off. This is the average ROE of banks pre-COVID. It's less than double digit. These are the top earners in this category. But telcos, power and utilities are still up there. The point I'm driving at here is that banks and the banking industry must remain healthy to support the economy, economy's recovery. If we think that the banks need to be restrained in making profits, their loans capacity will be affected. Okay? If you put caps on interest rates, the ability to lend will also be affected. It may sound self-serving actually, but it is the reality of our situation. And that's why we have 94 banks to prevent us from taking advantage of the consumer, the borrower, and the depositors. So the first thing we need to do as an institution is to make sure our balance sheet is healthy so that we can support the economy and support the economic recovery. Okay. The second thing that we did in order to sustain is we've accepted that no new digital working arrangements are necessary. So our working environment has been adjusted so we can work more digitally. Frankly, five months ago, I wouldn't even know how to operate this thing. or We wouldn't even have this capability, but now it's commonplace. We have also resumed the investments we started two years ago, cybersecurity and our next gen information technology platform. Our cybersecurity by the end of the year will be feeding one terabyte of data daily and analyzing it to make sure that everything is in order in our systems. The next generation IT platforms will allow us to be nimble. You won't see it early on because these are platforms, but will allow us to move quickly and have new products on board and have data integrated easily going forward. We are also in the testing phase, although we can test because there's not much activity on the retail side, some of our new capabilities. We call it BDO Pay because it uses QR codes. Uh, we have the upgrade of our online banking, uh, which is actually already in testing. All of these are in testing, but it'll probably be a while before we roll it out because we haven't been able to test it in an open environment. We're also upgrading the end-to-end -end process. Clearly, as people move to digital, our branches need to be able to cope with people's habits. So we're upgrading this. There are actually two branches with the prototype set up for this. And hopefully things go well, we will be rolling it out by next year. So the second thing we're doing is actually rolling out our products and continuing with our investments. The third, 
which is what you see here, is actually our continued branch expansion. These are actual pictures of our people in action in our rural bank market, network bank. This is something that most people do not see. That is how far we go to meet the clients. And that's something that we'll have to continue if we are to bring in the 70% of the population into the formal banking sector. Now, most of us in Metro Manila often see the banking industry through our lenses, which is what we see here. For these people, the most important thing is actually access. It's not so much rates, it's not so much products, it's really about access. So we go out to them, we reach out, and we try to bring them in to the system. In the end, for us in the bank, it's a balancing act. On one hand, we need to support the needs of the economy through lending. And clearly, oftentimes, uh, you will hear the BSP saying that the banks need to lend more. On the other hand, we're not lending our money. We are lending your money. So we need to exercise proper due diligence and care when we lend to potential customers. And that is where we need to have the right balancing act. And we get criticized if we don't lend enough, and we get criticized if we have bad debts. That's part of the game, and we need to make sure that we're able to balance that. In the end, BDO remains committed to delivering on our promise to find ways to serve you. In all ways, always. Okay, thank you and i'm happy to answer any questions okay. thank you uh, sir nestor for that uh, for sharing your uh, what you have done so far and continue to do to uh -huh. adapt to the changing business landscape in the in the philippines because of uh, covid 19. Uh, by the way in attendance also is uh, boyet murcia you're uh, the partner in I charge of <laughs> yeah, uh, we have uh, the first question from uh, PBP Ricky Trinidad, sir. Um, yes. His question is this. Some analysts say the EPS growth from the current baseline 2020 to 2021 will exceed 25%. Do you think this is uh, doable? EPS growth of the big three banks, BDO, Metro Bank, and BPI. Uh Okay, I think the context has to be understood. This is 20 to 21. Right. And if you look at 20, if you look at only the first half, most banks have already shown decline in earnings close to 20 to 30%. We've shown decline in earnings closer to 50%. So going from 50 to 75% is actually doable. And it's not because we're doing well, to be honest, it's because we're coming from a low base. We have a very bad 2020 because of provisioning. So trying to improve on that is not going to be a major achievement for us. It's kind of um, natural because of where we're coming from. So it will be a back-to-back -back situation, but in general, I think it is, um, it is reasonable to expect that. Right. Are you satisfied with that answer, uh, uh, PBP Ricky? Yes, very satisfied. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. We have another question here, uh, Sir Nestor. Mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, she said, uh, this is from Maria Irmatan. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your time <laughs> and valuable sharing of your uh, impact that you imparted uh, with us on BDO's efforts to help the banking sector and the public adjust to these trying times, Mr. Tan. May we request the interbank branch withdrawal charges be lifted, especially at this time that we transact with the nearest available BDO branch within our residence. I personally look up to BDO because 
of its huge branch network and large asset base. More power to you and BDO. Okay. Um, thank you for that question. The interbranch issue is something that is um, more an operational problem than it is a servicing problem. You see, what, what we normally do for clients is we accommodate the interbranch, especially. Is that it? Sorry. You're good, sir. You're good. Yeah. So, what we normally do is we accommodate interbranch transactions, but we have to manage um, abuse of its use. And I, I think it, it needs a little bit of explanation. If you look at us historically, about a third of our branches are open on weekends. If we open it up for interbranch transactions, it will throw off our manpower planning because the branches that are open late or open on weekends will be inundated with the activity of other branches. So what we're trying to do is discourage that and make sure that we're able to service the real depositors of the branch. I know it's not, um, it's not the answer that you would like to hear, but rest assured that for good clients, we do accommodate interbranch transaction. The other thing that most people do not uh, appreciate is that we hope that we haven't opened up our branches such that you can bank anywhere. And that's for security reasons. Because by doing that, we will be exposing your data everywhere. So we need to make sure that we balance operational uh, practicalities with client conveniences. Okay. So I suppose, Irma, you're satisfied with that answer? Otherwise, um... Let me know. Okay, so we have another question from uh, Mr. Ricky Trinidad, uh, Sir Nestor. Mm -hmm. He said, do you think, sorry, it's moving. <laughs> do you think the, Philippine, the Philippines is over banked, 94 banks compared to Malaysia? What are the disadvantages? if we are overbooked or overbanked? Um, my biased answer is yes. The disadvantage is actually scale and therefore cost to the consumer. Um, if I'll just use uh, an example. If the smaller banks in the rural or in the provincial areas are part of bigger institutions, then they'll have better services for the underserved. Mm -hmm. So basically, a lot of the 94 banks that are on the lower end of the spectrum will probably not have the same kind of services that the big banks can offer. So it's better that they are part of bigger institutions like the Malaysian market, the Canadian market, where you only have a handful of banks. So that is my personal opinion and maybe it's a biased opinion, but I think in banking, you need scale. Right. Okay. Thank you, sir. PBP, uh, Ricky, are you satisfied? Yeah, it's extremely satisfied. All right. Okay. Next question, sir, from Mr. Johnny C. The government is uh, trying to stimulate uh, the economy and help SMEs survive during this pandemic. BSP has been cutting interest rates also to achieve this purpose. However, what the local banks have done is to pull back lending, call in loans, and uh, really cutting lending rates. Why is this so? Okay. Um, actually, may um, I go back to um, my slide earlier about striking the right uh, balance. Right. During this time of pandemic, I hope you will agree with me that businesses are actually not 
in a in a better position than they were pre pandemic meaning you will um, you will agree with me that certain businesses will have difficulties operating in this time of uh, difficulty that's true and if you follow that from banking from the banking perspective risks will actually go up because the average client will probably have a higher probability of default right if they have a higher probability of default and you have higher NPLs, the natural tendency for banks is to stop lending on the bottom end of the credit spectrum where they feel that they might have a difficulty repaying their loans. So that's one. Uh, also, it is a question of capital adequacy. For us, it may not be a problem, but if a medium-sized bank is expecting a lot of uh, losses mm -hmm. and they expect their capital to be affected. I go back to the capital adequacy ratio and the loans capacity. The natural tendency for them is to lessen lending because their capital is getting impaired. Yes. So that yes. is what's happening. It's not that we don't want to support the economy, but I often uh, remind people that we're actually lending your money. If in a time of pandemic, we continue with our lending practices, we might be considered reckless. Even in our own personal affairs, during this time of pandemic, we defer some of our expenditures. We actually save more. And the same thing with banks. There are certain lending uh, practices that you start to stop temporarily. And frankly, it's often misunderstood as cold and unwilling to support the economy. That's not true. We are looking after your money. Okay. Exercising your fiduciary responsibility, yes. sir. All right, so uh, there's another question here from uh, Mr. Wilfredo Placino. What is the chance for the revival of the SPB being acted within 2020, sir? Um, it's beyond my control, but I think it's moving, so there's a good chance. Um, okay. The SPV is actually good for uh, banks to be able to leave the problems behind them and move forward. So I hope it gets uh, enacted. Okay. We still have time, sir. Can you still accommodate uh, a number of questions? Okay. The next question is from PP Kit uh, Harrison. Uh, thank you for the most interesting talk. When implementing your business continuity plan for uh, pandemics, for real, how many for real? How many big surprises did you receive over what you have seen in annual tests and plans? Um, <laughs> good question. Uh, let me be honest. We've only tested our contingency plans in test environments. We haven't really been tested with a real problem or real pandemic wherein our site is totally uh, inoperable. The worst that happened to us was Ondoy, where in some of our operations in Binondo were flooded and we couldn't get through them, through to them, we can get through to them, but we were able to operate. Um, to answer the question is, I'm fairly confident that we will be able to um, muddle through. I just don't know whether it will be as painless as uh, we think it is during mm -hmm. the test. Okay, that must have been really tough, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question from um, PVP Minko of uh, RCTW. Do you think the Philippine market is ready for the private banking space? If so, yes. how is BDO preparing for it? and that hopefully it reaches not only high network 
individuals, but also the affluent segment. I am very interested with our growth as to, to I'm aligned in this segment as I work for Avalo Swiss in FinTech, which offers the leading core solution for the private banking segment. Sir. Yes, uh, I believe that it's ripe here. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that banking is opening up. It's no longer, especially in wealth, it's no longer a domestic business, but uh, a regional or even global business. Two things will drive that. Number one, people will start to have investments in peso, in, in pesos and in another currency. In this market, it's most likely dollar. There are not too many outlets for dollars here. So that means there will be opportunities for those that can access these instruments to offer it to local clients. Uh, at BDO, we've actually segmented the market along those lines. At the top end, we have a private bank. In the middle, we have BDO Securities, our brokerage and trust, which we are um, using for the uh, mass affluent. And most recently, we have our online banking, which is what we're using for um, online trading, which is what we're using for the emerging affluent. We are not yet, by the way, we're not yet there, but we do believe that there is a market for that. All right. Thank you for sharing that, sir. From Mr. Conrado Banal, any plan for uh, overseas expansion, sir? Uh, no, not yet. I think yet. we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of uh, opportunities here. 70% of our population is still unbanked. All right. So... Here's a question from your friend, right, Miss uh, or past president Raisa Chanova, sir. Is it possible to have higher online transaction limits? The limit of 50K a day is restrictive since we now avoid going to branches to deposit or make payments. Also, when can we have QR codes to facilitate our online banking transactions? Okay. On the first question is we're moving towards that. And um, the reason for the 50,000 is actually more of security. Yes, right now, um, because of phishing, because of compromises on passwords and user, uh, user names, we're trying to limit the exposure. But at the time that we're able to employ a combination of uh, different types of biometrics, we should be able to increase that. But uh, bear with us, we're moving in that direction. As to the QR codes, this is part of BDO Pay. Uh, it's actually in testing mode. Uh, we should have been, actually, if it not for the pandemic, it should have been uh, ready for this Christmas season. But at this time, unfortunately, we have no way to test the volumes yet. So it will be a gradual roll out because there's no activity in the malls or in the uh, shopping centers. Thank you, sir. Now from uh, Mr. Renato Limhuko. Mr. Tan, when do you think the banks, uh, including BDO, can achieve branches banking, uh, that is a client may transact with uh, any branch, much like in the US, every convenient and suitable in a uh, COVID environment? It uh, right. seems related to the, the question earlier. Yeah, I think that's a very valid uh, request, which is what I, I mentioned earlier. It's not a system problem. We can actually do it now. In fact, uh, your signatures are um, digitized and there's images that we can send everywhere for do, to, uh, to do signature verification. Mm -hmm. The problem is actually privacy. By opening it up, we will open up all of our clients to all our branches. And we are um, concerned for the client's privacy and security. Okay. And maybe I can step back about 20 years ago. This was born out of banks fear that their data is being used for uh, criminal activities. Okay. Somebody in the South looking at 
who are the, uh, they'll have an insider, somebody looking at, in the South, looking at uh, data from, uh, from people in the North or people in the North looking at data people in the South for criminal activities. Now, having said that, I think once we're able, and I mentioned this, to apply um, biometric verification, then we should be able to address that. But that still will require physical presence. Okay, thank you, sir. Now, this question is from uh, the president of the Rotary Club of Makati. What is BDO doing to bolster its IT system address cyber security concerns? I think you touched on that a, this yeah. a bit earlier, uh, sir. Actually, we have upgraded our cyber security system. Um, the first level that we've done is what we call surveillance. So we put in all of the requirements to make sure that we have sensors all around our systems. Very much like, if I may use an analogy, it's like putting a lot of um, CCTVs all around. So it's surveillance. The second thing is actually capture an organization. So we get all of these things that we're getting, organizing it, and then determining whether there are unusual patterns. The third is actually remediation. If there are unusual patterns, what do we do? We send people to check it. We send things that um, will make sure that we cross off uh, access temporarily until we're able to discover what's going on. And the fourth level is actually in inter intelligence sharing. Clearly, the attacks on banks are actually mirroring attacks in other countries. Mm -hmm. So the only thing, not the only thing, but one of the things that will make sense is for us to share intelligence. So if one entity is attacked, then we can then have the right uh, preventive action to prevent that from happening here. I call it the vaccine, getting it ready. I did mention that this whole exercise um, is now feeding close to one terabyte of data daily. And we're analyzing it. Now, the point about cybersecurity is that it's never a guarantee that you won't be attacked or you won't get hit. It, however, limits the damage if you do it right. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Pipi, uh, Tito, uh, Panlilio, you're raising your hand. Please go ahead and ask your question. Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Tan, uh, well, first of all, thank you for uh, guesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm just interested uh, since, of course, you're private to, to data uh, from your bank as well as perhaps uh, your peers no, in the industry. How bad or how serious is uh, the past two problems, you know, the, uh, the past two loan ratios of banks? Of course, we've heard about it, we have read about it, but really, is it exaggerated because of the COVID situation or uh, it is real? Uh, okay, first level corporate banking, say the big boys, in the big mm -hmm. boys level, how, how good or how bad is uh, you know, credit standing so far, credit experience? Then on commercial banking, you know, uh, medium scale or up to uh, upper level, uh, medium businesses, no? the beyond the type commercial. Uh, how is it there? And then, of course, the, the last uh, tranche is uh, the, the small, medium scale, no, okay. industries. Let me answer Just that. Kind of share with us your experience in this score. Let me answer that two ways. Okay. The non-performing loans, the delinquencies, will actually uh, look a lot worse than the write-offs. And it's because of the, the treatment. They want, people want to play it safe. So the moment you turn 90 days past you, your NPL or 60 days, depending on the type of uh, transaction. The, right, the write-offs actually, for the most part, is already very close to what banks have set aside, knowing what we know now knowing what we know now. My guess is that the write-offs will be very close to what right, most video. banks have already set aside. Maybe a little bit more, but not really damaging to the capital. If I were to look at it 
top corporate and vulnerable industries, mostly in entertainment, travel, and airlines. Those are the ones that will get hit. But generally, the rest of the corporate banking portfolio will survive this. Commercial banking, I think it's a matter of uh, liquidity position. So if banks are proactive and they're able to address the liquidity position, they can minimize this. Commercial banking will see some losses from those without uh, a good uh, value proposition. The business franchise is not strong enough. And maybe this will be in the form of um, small retailers, uh, small eateries. So there will be some possible losses there, but not going to be substantial because the higher end of the middle market will probably, in, our, in my view, survive, given of what we know and what we see now. Consumer is a big problem. And I think it's driven by OFWs. A lot of the overseas Filipino workers are coming back. And they're the ones that will create problems for banks because they're the ones that are buying all of these uh, properties on pre-selling basis. It's their income that's supporting the families here. It's their income that's supporting uh, the um, loans of small businesses that their families are engaging in. So there will be some uh, level of uh, losses in that category. Is it as bad as most people think it is? I would say my estimate, but this is just a guess at this stage, you're looking at probably at three to four times existing PNL levels pre-COVID. Mm. NPS. Well, it, so is that approaching 10%? Because you know, uh, before COVID, you had a very good, the banking sector had a yeah. very good uh, NPL ratio. Uh, that's probably just what, doing one to 2%. So when you say four times, so it's approaching 10% this time. Well, I mean, I'm looking at it from more like a 6%. Four times the, because the, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm looking at it from a, a big bank perspective. We're probably looking at a, um, a 6% <coughs> NPL. I see. Uh, and lost that is, uh, that is uh, well, that's manageable, very manageable. Yeah. <clears throat> but it's okay, thank you. totally different from the smaller banks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey, thank you, so, Mr. Tan. Yeah. Thank you, PPT, for that question. Now we have uh, a question from uh, Rotarian George Barcelon. Uh, Nestor, do you uh, do you see P Peso further appreciating? <laughs> uh, uh, may I elaborate on that? <laughs> yeah, I'm not the right person to ask because every time I buy, uh, the peso goes um, goes down every time I sell. It's the other way around. So, yeah. Uh, okay, let me share with you what the drivers are. Right now, what you have is a weak dollar that's propping up the peso. Okay. The second thing contributing to that is that we have limited imports because people are not expanding. So the demand for the dollar is also down. Now. What do we see on the horizon? I think if this continues in its current phase, we might see the peso just around where we are now. A lot of people are thinking that uh, the dollar will continue to be weak, but always bear in mind that all it needs is one swing of optimism and the dollar will, will start to appreciate. So it's a long way of saying, I don't know. And <laughs> we're probably not going to take a... Um, uh, yes, that's it. Like a stab at it. You know, you know Nestor, yeah. what I noticed is that our currency appreciated more. Although we know that the U.S. currency dollar is low, but we have appreciated more compared to the other ASEAN countries. And, and uh, it affects our uh, competitiveness in exporting yeah. At the same time, you touch on the OFW, the remittances, they get less peso, and that really badly affects the uh, consuming public. Uh, so, so we have been, well, we've been also telling uh, the uh, economic team that uh, they should really take a hard look 
and try to address this issue because there are talks that peso could break 44 and i tell you it's a it's a big impact on the economy yeah i, I think a big factor most people are um, overlooking is that companies are not importing yeah there's no demand but the moment that i'm i'm, I'm I guess it's wishful thinking on our part. The moment that people see optimism in the economy opening up, let's just say, let's just say for argument, the promise of a vaccine coming and that things will get better, then people will start uh, importing. You're also looking at, um, and we've noticed this, that inventory is starting to uh, be at low levels. And somehow, Somebody will have to support the construction business with steel. Somebody will have to support that with uh, supplies. And um, yeah, the, the, the strong peso is just driven by low demand, no demand. Yes. yes. I'm just wondering okay. how the other ASEAN countries manage it. They're not, they're not, their currency is not strengthening as much as we, we are. Yeah. No? So uh, it affects us. Thank you, yeah. Nestor. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rotary and George. I have uh, two more questions here, sir. Would you mind if I just combine them? Because we have two minutes uh, left. Okay. From uh, PBP Larry Samaniego and uh, Irma, Ms. Irma Tan. The first one is, is there a real threat of the so-called cryptocurrency in the banking system? The second one is, do you have plans toward expanding banking services in the rural areas? Uh, I'll answer the second one first. Uh, the second one is definitely we're expanding in the rural areas and we're using Video Network Bank as our vehicle for that, which is our rural bank subsidiary. The second one, cryptocurrency, uh, I don't think it's a threat. I think it will complement what we have. Now, there's a big difference between cryptocurrency uh, and the privacy that cryptocurrency uh, provides, okay? Now, cryptocurrency on its own is not bad. It's actually going to complement the economy. But the types of cryptocurrency that we've come to know are those that are used mostly for confidentiality, which implies a certain amount of illegal activity underneath it. Now, that's going to be a threat. Okay, so I guess that's the uh, final question, sir. Um, thank you again for um, uh, sharing those information and uh, answering the questions uh, uh, that were uh, raised. Okay, now let's go to uh, the next part of our program, which is the response, starting off with uh, PVP Ricky Trinidad. Thank you. We are honored and fortunate to hear from uh, Mr. Nestor Tan to better understand how the economy will unfold. BDO being the largest bank in terms of assets gives the business community as well as the public at large confidence and a calming effect. that our economy will eventually sub stabilize. Thank you to BDO and the leadership of its president, Mr. Nestor Tan. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll have our, uh, the president of the Rotary Club of Makati, Mr. Peter Manzano. Thank you, Chris. On my way to the Rotary office, I was thinking aloud saying to myself, no one is spared by this pandemic. Everyone is affected, even the banking industry is affected. And to my surprise, my driver, who is normally quiet, spoke to me and said, that is true, sir, I'm worried about the state of my bank, he said. I asked, why, what's your bank? To which he replied, BDO, sir. So I said, no, 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 no. Yes, BDO suffered some losses, but don't worry, BDO is solid. Still, I was curious why my driver was worried about the state of his bank. So I further inquired, what are you so worried about your bank? And he said, well, sir, 
I am worried about my bank because I have tried withdrawing money from five different ATMs in five different BDO branches. And they have told me the same thing, insufficient funds. <laughs> Not to worry, Mr. Speaker, I have already advanced his five-month salary and told him to deposit to his video account for it to earn interest. That COVID-19 is a game changer is now a truism. And we are glad to learn that BDO has, has successfully implemented and continues to implement its three-phase response, adjusting, normalizing, and sustaining. It is also true that the public is starting to embrace digital banking and doing business with almost everything online. Pre-pandemic period, I could not imagine myself doing online bank payments or fund transfers for my local purchases. The thought of frequently opening my bank account and inputting my username and password and paying online was worrisome on my part. I kept thinking, how do I know someone has not just stolen my security details. Just four months ago, one of the country's biggest banks, not video, lost almost 200 million pesos to cyber criminals who stole money through ATM withdrawals and electronic fund transfers during a long weekend in June. Before this, the country figured in the financial scandal involving a foreign payment firm which claimed that around $2.1 billion uh, missing funds were deposited in two of the biggest banks in the country. These events are not helpful in building the public's confidence in the banking institution's cybersecurity systems, especially during these times when, we're, when we are all forced to make that big shift to digital banking caused by the pandemic. The public is wary and they wonder whether their online transactions are really secure. Thus, if we expect the public to truly embrace this new normal of digital banking and doing online business transactions, it is high time that the banking institutions do something to upgrade their cybersecurity capacity by fortifying their information technology systems. Then and only then can the public fully embrace and accept this new way of doing business with reasonable confidence. And I am glad to know that BDO is doing something to address this legitimate public concern and if only to assure my driver that this money in the <laughs> bank is secured. Banking establishments, though most of the time are not given much attention or appreciation they much deserve, undoubtedly play a specific role in the society, most especially in times of crisis. There's no question that this, during these trying times, the financial sector, particularly banks, play a vital role in, absor in absorbing the shock of an economic crisis such as what we are experiencing nowadays. They provide the most needed credit to keep businesses afloat. In fact, under the recently passed new Bayanihan to recover as one act or the Baro Act, as cited by you earlier, the law direct banks to provide 60 day grace period to their qualified loan bank clients needing loan relief. In the words of Mr. Henry Smith, banks are to the economy what the heart is to, to the human body. They cycle necessary capital through the whole, and they are barely noticed until pressure, necessity, or crisis. Thank you, Mr. Nestor Tan, for sharing with us your time and expertise. Thank you for sharing to us the best practices that BDO has been instituting in its business process that in a way assures the public that this shift into digital banking is something that we must all embrace and live with as the new normal. Thank you for leading an institution that has responded well during these trying times. So on behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati, our uh, Rotarians, to my classmates, our Rotaractors, and to all the other guests in attendance, please accept our heartfelt gratitude for taking time for, in being with us today. Once again, thank you, sir. And as tokens of our appreciation for your time and service, we shall be giving you a copy of our 50th anniversary coffee table book, which contains our club's 50 years of community service and fellowship together with a bottle of red wine for you to enjoy while going through the pages of our book. Once again, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. Thank you, President Peter, for, that, for another superb response. Always well prepared.
Now, before the adjournment, uh, may I request everyone to please turn on your camera for the photo off. Please turn on your camera. Are we good, Cos? One more. All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Now let's go to the adjournment, starting with PVP Ricky Trinidad. <clears throat> Thank you again to everyone. This meeting is adjourned. And finally, President Peter Manzano of RTM. On behalf of the Rotary Club of Makati, this meeting is adjourned. Great job, Peter. President. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Well, Nestor, nice seeing you. Thank Nestor. you, everyone. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.